Welcome to The Thinking Tree, a podcast to help believers renew their minds and reform their hearts. I'm Adam Sanchez. And I'm Jeff No. And today we are discussing parenting in the early years and the importance of biblical instruction and discipline. Mm. This is going to be a fiery oh one. Oh boy. All right, we're back again, Jeff, with our special guests. We have the lovely Tanya No, your wife, you know her. I do. Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> All the way down from the mountain yeah. of Castaic. From the, uh, up on the double up C mountain. Up on the hill, yeah. yes. yes. And then we're back also with our elder, Dave Hubbs. Dave, Hello. great to have you again. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm glad we didn't scare you away last time, but this one's even more fiery. This is uh -oh. one of the most hot button topics among parents, period, and especially among Christian parents. So parents have a lot to consider when we're talking about instruction and discipline. There's theology. How do we help our kids understand the way? There's the morality side, teaching our kids right and wrong, and just navigating this world, uh, dealing with worldly thinking versus biblical thinking, and everything that's thrown at our kids daily uh, from media and the news, every which direction. And we have to figure out how do we do all of this with instructing our kids towards Christ and disciplining them when they surely don't go God's way, when they are going to harm themselves or harm others. And all of that is in the realm of instruction and discipline. So we wanted to start off the conversation today with how did you begin to bring in the gospel to your children when they were young? So when they're those, those really early years when they're not having conversations with you and you kind of hinted at this last episode, Tanya, about, you know, they're not talking back to you, but mm -hmm. like, how do you begin mm -hmm. to do that? Bring the gospel to bear when they're young. Well, it's a mindset first and foremost. You have to be thinking about it yourself in order to be able to communicate it. So it's really kind of disengaging from all the practicals. I've got to do this. I've got to do that too. What is God doing? What does God require of me today? What does God require of my child today? Um, and so it's a it's a mindset that you have to be in. Um, time in the word as a parent before you start your day is really helpful in this. Um, but for us, it was kind of accumulating resources around myself, um, you know, Know, when we did have the television on, we were watching Veggie Tales, or we were watching some Bible character show. There was a silly thing called Bible Man Bible for Man. years, Bible so Man. we oh, watched yeah. Bible Man. Um, and we're dating ourselves here. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my boys but, love that. But even if it's corny, and that was a very corny show, but even if it's corny, to be able to sit down afterwards and talk about what was he teaching, you know, what was Veggie Tales endorsing? We had Adventures in Odyssey that we listened to in the car. The kids loved to hear stories like that. We had we had the kids in Awana, and so Awana had tapes with all of their scripture to song. So we were singing those things. So we were kind of immersing ourselves all the time in that. Um, and just as Deuteronomy tells us, you know, when you're awake, when you're sleeping, when you're walking, when you're lying, you're supposed to be talking about the gospel. And that's what we did. We just tried to talk about it all the time. Remember just looking out the window and saying, who made the clouds? What did the clouds look like? What, tell me the animals God created. I mean, we're just constantly thinking and talking about the Lord as much as we possibly could. Um, and they, they seem to get it. They, and they really seemed to enjoy it. I asked Chandler today, I said, did you ever question the truth of scripture? And she said, I never did. She said, from early on, I just always believed it. You told me and I always believed it. So, you know, and thing. Chandler also said today that she remembers things that we put to song. Mm -hmm. And so constantly songs in the house, in the minivan, we had a minivan. That, that's, that's an actual <laughs> I don't thing. know if I'm more shocked by the <laughs> minivan or that you sang. Well, I know. You were, <laughs> no, you no, were no, a no, songwriter? No, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Tell no, Grant. Let, yeah. let, let's get it right. No, we had tapes. Oh, okay. have you heard cassette of cassette tapes? tapes? Cassette tapes in the minivan, uh, but the books of the Bible to music, uh, stories to music, uh, even that we. Saul chases David was mm -hmm. like Chandler's mm -hmm. favorite yep. story, and it was it was a it was a guy who, an actor who brought the story to life, and and she wanted to listen to it every time she got in the minivan, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. Uh, those resources were so helpful. But in terms of just conversations with our kids, um, captured time with our kids. And when I say captured, I mean, when they're running around, it's hard to talk about gospel things. But when they're eating a meal, when they're going to bed and there's that captured time where they're a little bit quieter and they can focus, those are the times to, to be intentional about gospel conversations. That's really good. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I would echo everything that you guys said. It's, it's as we love the Lord, it just becomes a part of our lifestyle. It's something that we do naturally as we get up in the morning, walk along the way and sit down at night. And we're teaching our children about the Bible from a very early age. We start out with story Bibles and, and things like that. And, and then we progress from there. And we, we for, for us, we felt like we just wanted to to bring all the resources to bear that we had on mm-hmm. our on our children's spiritual development. Mm-hmm. And so whether it was church or whether it was Awanas or whether it was Bible Man or Veggie Tales <laughs> or homeschooling, homeschooling for us was a way to disciple our children, mm-hmm. children yeah. to teach them as we right. walk along the way. Right. And so, you know, by, by doing that, the children understand that scripture and God is important to right. my parents right. and it, therefore it's important. Right. Amen. And I think too, a lot of parents feel ill-equipped at times. You know, I didn't grow up in a Christian school or I didn't get saved till I was an adult and I don't know all these things. And um, I have just encouraged parents and seen that just start with the children's Bible storybook. You read to your kids and you might go, I, I don't know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, who's a Bendigo. And yet you can read it to your children and then go, and read the scriptures and read the full story and it will help you understand. And so even as an adult, you can grow with the faith of a child and grow through those simple little stories in their Bible books and you'll grow in your faith as well. Yeah, and and bringing along the spirituality of having a minivan. I mean, that is such a spiritual experience. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Having a minivan. It's in the Bible. Dodge Caravan. (laughs) Yes. That was was the car. We had had a a caravan. I don't think they make that one. I know. No, 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 they don't. Dodge got smart. It's in in the Bible, first hesitation. The world just isn't what it used to be. (laughs) Yeah. That's good. All right, so a special question here for you, Dave. We wanted you to answer this one. How did you help your young children see the difference between right and wrong and God's way versus our way. Right, so I think it's important to, to uh, and we've been saying it all along, is to, to, to teach your children scripture from a very early age, even, even before they're able to comprehend it, because at the very least, it gets the parent in the habit of teaching their children scripture. And so as the child grows, the child comes to the understanding that their parents fall under the authority of God and scripture. Mm -hmm. And their parents aren't saying things uh, just because like do this because I say so, Mm -hmm. right? They're doing it because this is is what they're directed to do in in the Bible. And that the Bible is the authority over the family and not just the parents saying, because I told you so. And then also they learn that as you teach scripture and as you teach them about God, that, that right and wrong reveals God to them, right? That, mm. that they, um, they know not to lie because God's not a liar. God is truthful. Yeah, that's good. They lo- learn to love and to be kind and to be compassionate because God is. And so you, you, as the child understands that we fall under the authority of scripture, we're actually revealing God to them, not just right and wrong, but right and wrong because that's who God is. That's his nature. Amen. That's really good. Now I want to I want to transition then from the instruction side to the discipline side. And this is the this is the one that it gets everyone's feathers all riled up here. Uh, there can be though a misunderstanding of God's word because of those cultural influences that we have today, but there's also a lack of biblical knowledge about raising children. So before we go to the questions, I just want to delay the biblical f- uh, framework regarding this topic. So first, Parents are the authority in a child's life according to Scripture. Ephesians 3, 1 and following teach us that. The the structure is essential for a child who needs to learn God's ways from God's people. Living under authority is actually a blessing and not a curse. Amen. Second, the goal of our parenting with instruction and discipline is not to fill our children's lives with just activities and possessions of things, but to teach them that only the living God can satisfy our souls. The third thing is, is that communicating well to our children, you guys have talked about this, must be foundational. No instruction or discipline should occur without communication, and we should cultivate a lifestyle of communication about true things all the time with our children. And lastly, the idea of discipline, and this is the hard one, particularly using the rod in the early years, it's not only a biblical idea. It is loving. Mm -hmm. Children don't just need to hear the gospel. Being born into wrath means that children are not ethically and morally neutral. They are lost sheep who need the great shepherd. 
Proverbs 22, 15 tells us, folly is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 13, 24 tells us, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Our children need correction, even physically at times. Now this should be done with kindness and with love as those who love their children, parents who love their children and want to help them from going their own way in foolishness away from God. Proverbs 19, 18 tells us that lacking discipline is like putting our child to death. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14 tells us not to withhold discipline by the rod. Our children will not physically die by the rod, but rather that rod can help save our child from physical death and can also be used to help save them from spiritual death. In those passages, it's represented by Sheol. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 29, 15 tells us that the rod gives wisdom. Proverbs 3, 11 and following tell us that Yahweh's love is seen in his discipline and that this also leads to wisdom. So wisdom leads to blessing and peace and light. Proverbs 3, 23 tells us wisdom leads a man to walk in God's way without stumbling. So if you want your children to have unshakable faith, there's another plug mm -hmm. for the unshakable video cast series. They need wisdom. And one of the means to wisdom is through discipline. And in those early years of life, it is often provided through the rod. So the Bible is not silent about discipline. This is just a selection of key passages regarding the rod in discipline and the results of discipline leading to wisdom. But in this modern era, and very particularly in westernized societies, there has been a massive pushback against discipline. Not only are parents viewed as unloving if they don't affirm sinful behaviors pursued by their children, but parents are culturally ridiculed if they object to allowing a misguided youth to pursue permanent and damaging changes to their bodies. So with all of that being said, I want to hear from you guys. What did you learn about biblical discipline? How did you practice using the rod when your children were young? First of all, let me just say that uh, address all your inquiries to Adam at oakhillbible.com. Uh, no, just kidding. No, that was that was that, it was beautiful what you just shared. Mm -hmm. And and from Proverbs, so I've heard people try to say before. I, I'm sorry, I'm going off script here. Go for it. Um, that oh well, that's that's Old Testament stuff. You know, as if that's part of the law that's been superseded by the New Covenant. Now this is Proverbs, and what is the book of Proverbs? It's a book of wisdom. And it has so much to say about wisdom and parenting that is timeless. So mm -hmm. anyway, just throwing Amen. that in there. Yeah. Um, years ago, Jeff and I uh, taught a class on parenting for littles. And one of the topics we taught about one night was the topic of spanking. Literally had people coming out of the woodwork saying, we're going to pray for you. This is going to be a tough night. And anyway, so we got into this room. We had about 60 parents there, started talking, shared very many, you know, most of the same scriptures that you shared. And we're going to talk about the topic of uh, spanking. Um, and we found that uh, we actually did a survey. How many of you are opposed? Most of them raised their hands. And this is 30 years ago. Um, but what it came down to seemingly was the different definitions that everybody held mm -hmm. for the word spanking. And we all have our own grid of thought that we grew up with. So when our parents use the word spanking and we come to now view what they did as the true definition of that word, because that's what they said we, they were doing and that's what we experienced. But when the Bible speaks of the rod as a form of discipline, it does not refer to hitting a child. It doesn't mean the back of a hand from an angry parent. It does not mean the slap across the face or like a flailing arm swung over the front seat to reach the child in the back seat. It does not mean excessive force that would cause bleeding or even extreme bruising. It does not mean the parent is out of control or yelling. The picture of what the Bible is telling us lines up with all the other principles of scripture. So this is the correct view that we need to have. A child commits a sin. He disobeys, he's disrespectful, whatever the offense. The loving parent stops what they're doing, or if they can't stop what they're doing in the moment, they set a time frame when they can. And they sit with that child, they explain how grieved they are over what the child did. They explain how the child violated God's law and how as a parent, we are called to discipline them because we love them and we wanna teach them to honor and obey the Lord. 
the, ch- the child's given an opportunity to respond. Hopefully they apologize. Hopefully they repent. The parent gently turns them around, spanks them on their bottom with a rod, and then hugs them and prays with them. The behavior is dealt with. The parent's authority is enforced. The child understands their offense. Forgiveness is granted and the relationship is restored. Mm. When we explained that and we actually even modeled it on a child, a doll. We brought a doll, yeah. Right. When we explained that, the parents were like, oh, I don't have a problem with that. Well, that's what biblical spanking is. It's usually that we have a warped view of what that is or what was inflicted on us that causes us to have problems with this. So that principle, it's very, very important for parents to understand that together. Um, And then when we speak about the rod, the other part of this question that you asked was how did we enforce that when our children were young? We didn't start with a rod when Chandler was six months old. But at the age of six months old, she needed some reason directing. So we started with very mild things like a, a, a slap on the wrist. Or a pat on the top, top yeah, of the hand. Yeah. yeah, or a pinch on the thigh. It was very minor, very directed, little bit of pain, but a firm voice, we're not going to do that, and a little bit of pain. And so she started learning early on that there was pain and negative associated with disobedience. Um, and then as she got older, it was more age-appropriate ramping up, so to speak, and until you're starting to use the rod at a, at a little bit of an older age. And every kid's going to be a variable on that. Parents have to come to that decision on that. But it's not like, oh, we're never going to use the rod. That shouldn't be the response or the answer, but it's going to be when can we or when will we use it on our child. But it's much younger than I think some people think. Um, and the rod should be very carefully. It's not a you know, my, yeah, even that word rod is kind of scary. Right. It's not an iron bar. Right. <laughs> which is what people think. Like it's an right. iron bar. Right. No, right. I mean we used it we used a little wooden spoon. Right. It's designed to be, I mean, really a rod it, it scripturally is talking about like a branch off of a tree. So it's wood, it's pliable, it's soft, it's it's not something that's gonna inflict, you know, breaking of skin or anything like that. Um, but figure out what that is for you and your family and then administer that correctly. Biblically. Yeah, I, and I, uh, Adam, I love the verse that you quoted, uh, Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, mm-hmm. yeah. hates his son. Uh, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And diligently is is important. And the, the, the discipline needs to be consistent. And I totally agree with you that it should never be done in anger. Mm-hmm. It, should, it should never be excessive or mm-hmm. ab- abusive. Uh, there are other forms of discipline as well that can that can supplement the rod. I mean, the rod is very effective, mm-hmm. but there are other forms that can be just as effective. And I think it makes it makes discipline even more effective when you have a toolbox of different different mm-hmm. ways that you discipline your child, like timeouts or withholding privileges uh, and things like that. Um, so consistency is very important that the, the parents should not be inconsistent about yeah, it. They, that's they huge. Should be, if you tell your child that you're, they're going to get disciplined, they need to get disciplined to do it. and, and, yep. and it needs to be done, you know, quickly and, um, and don't change the rules on the fly mm-hmm. you know, just because it seems to fit, fit you. Um, also, dad and mom need to be on the same page. Absolutely. It can't be, you know, the, the mom can't be the disciplinarian yep. all the time. Yep. Both dad and mom need to be on the same page. Uh, and fathers uh, fathers can't be absent from the discipline process. Right. You know, father, even though, even though dads typically go to work right. and they're gone during the day, right. when they come home, uh, they need to be as much of the disciplinarian as, right. as, as the mom, if, if not more. Um, and so, and, and I, and I like your method of, you know, praying with the child and, and, um, uh, and, and then the, pr- the child praying as mm-hmm. well. And the child praying yep. and asking for forgiveness and then asking for forgiveness from God and from the people that, uh, they offended. So mm-hmm. yeah, all good. Yeah. I love the, I love the emphasis that you guys are all making on the principles behind it. That was going to be my next question. If you want to add anything, you can, but just to highlight some of the principles you guys are mentioning, this is a very well-intentioned form of discipline. This is not random. Right. Uh, you know, as Tanya, as you walked through multiple reasons, rationale, uh, the the undergirding of what it's not. Mm-hmm. This is not just a, an emotive response right. of anger to a child's dis, uh, disobedience. 
This is a very measured response to help correct the child to go the right way. Mm -hmm. And that is our ultimate desire. And I'm hearing that consistency uh, among all of you and the willingness to both partner in that with your spouse and be on the same page about that. And then to love your children enough, you know, Dave, you highlighted Proverbs 13, but to love your child enough to discipline, to discipline regularly, you know, Jeff, you were nodding your head when we were talking about the consistency part. Huge. Um, and that is, you can't, you can't discipline your children big, big, big time on one thing. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that could be bigger to mm -hmm. take a much softer approach. So that consistency and regularity is, is necessary. If, right? if uh, the parents listening right now haven't figured it out, they will. Their kids are very clever. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, if you become inconsistent, they will manipulate every little gap that you give them. Yep. So that it, you just, they have to know that there is going to be a consequence because they have violated God's law. That is so important. And us as the, the uh, authority under God have to meet that punishment out. But what a, what a, what a time to teach. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Yes. It's yeah. such a teaching time for kids. And at the end of it, you just want to make sure they feel like oh, we, are, we are reconciled. Mom and dad love you so much. And this is why we're doing this, because we don't want you to, to be outside of God's law. We love you so much. And it can actually be a very intense time of love. But I will say there were many times um, in, in our lives where uh, I have a hotter temper than Tanya. So if, if we got upset at our kids, it would be, Chandler, go to your room. And I would stop. Mm. And and I would talk to Tanya and she and we remind one another of the principle, deep breath, make sure you go in there with the right mindset. And if I had to wait a little longer, that's fine. I wasn't going to go in there in anger. And actually that little bit of waiting time uh, got to Chandler a little bit more, but she was more repentant by the time I got there, which was hilarious. Poor Chandler. She wasn't yeah. the only one disciplined in I her know. home. We do have a son <laughs> who do. probably got more spanks than her. Oh, no but, question. No, oh, <laughs> so let, me just, let me just clear the air. Tyler got way more than Chandler, <laughs> yeah. so... I know, but the yeah. boys do. They, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love one of the things you mentioned here, Jeff, about the the beautiful spiritual moment that can happen on the back end mm -hmm. of discipline. And you think about can that really happen if we're not disciplining our children? Mm. Because how can you joyfully embrace them after disobedience if there hasn't been that correction? Yeah. So, parent, I mean, when we see that the Proverbs thirteen twenty four lived out, if you're not disciplining your children and loving them well, you can't. You can't love them. Yeah. You can't love them at the back end of discipline and say, oh, it's okay. You just sinned in this way egregiously to our faces. I love you anyways. Yeah. It's like, we do. And because I love you, I'm going to correct you right. and help you to go the right, right. way yeah. because right. it's God's way. Right. Right. So Great. true. Yeah. And, and the I, children need to learn that there's, you know, just, just as all of us, we will give an account, right, mm -hmm. for our defiance. Right. And defiance has consequences and we mm -hmm. need to teach that mm -hmm. to our children. So a defiance starts in the heart and it manifests itself in behavior for which right. we yep. discipline. But spanking works in the opposite direction. And it's an opportunity to, to correct behavior, but an also an opportunity for the parent to minister to the heart, yep. mm -hmm. to teach the ch child what heart attitude was incorrect and what they need to put off and put on. Right. So you're teaching that to your child right. at an early right. age. right. I think that's something that's not talked about very often because we have parents that sometimes are both working. And so you have your child that's being watched by somebody else. Mm. And unfortunately, probably the biggest downfall is that you do not get to discipline all day long. Now, what stinks is that you come home and you only have that child for four hours in the evening before they go to bed. And you've got to try to get all of that discipline in during that time. And what parent wants to do that? That's not fun. It's not like, oh, good, I get to go home so I can spank my kid. It's like, we don't want to do that. And yet those are such teachable moments. And if we've relinquished those teaching moments to somebody else, we don't know what our child's being taught during the day you know, when they had a meltdown or a temper tantrum or disobeyed. So it really is important that those parents are very, very intentional when they do come home, that this could these are going to be rough nights. They could be hard nights and it's okay. We're going to dig in for that reason. Um, and then also too, the mindset for a mom who's home all day long with the kids, that's exhausting to be doing all of the discipline. Dad rolls in. The temptation for me sometimes was to say, wait till your dad comes home. I'm going to let dad deal with that when he gets home. Scary dad. 
bad. Yeah, yeah. Which in hindsight was really kind of my acquiescing the responsibility in the moment. Totally not fair to Jeff. He's been gone all day. He walks in, I'm like, hey, you got to spank him three times because they did this, this, and this. He wasn't there. He didn't witness it. And and I put off what I really was called to do in the moment, which was seize that moment, teach them, deal with it immediately. Um, when they're real little, they don't even remember <laughs> four hours later, something that they did. And so anyways, I kind of fumbled that a little bit. But I do think that this is a super important area of spiritual leadership for the husbands. You are not home during the day. You do not hear about 90% of the discipline issues, but you can revisit that when you come home. You sit down with your wife, you find out what the issues were, find out what the discipline was ministered, find out what the heart attitude was of your child, and then you go sit with your child and review it. Let's go through what happened and talk it through Mm -hmm. with them so that you're not relinquishing all of that spiritual leadership on your wife, which is hard for her, but then really it's your responsibility as a spiritual leader. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. a key component that even if you're not having to administer the spankings, you follow up on that and make sure you are in it with your child and that your children child understands that you support mom in that as well. So it's not like mom's the bad one and dad's the fun one. It's like, no, I, I want mom to do that and that's important. And when I'm here on the weekends or in the evenings, I will do that as well. So you're both participating. That's good. Now the the discipline with the rod season doesn't last forever. Amen. By God's grace, right? Yes. Like you yeah. mentioned, right. Tyler got Thankfully. older and right. sort yeah. of wrestling you back. Yeah, and, yeah all that. <laughs> uh, how did you decide when you when it was time to transition from that season of using the rod and discipline to not using the rod? For was us, it? it was it was when they complied with our directives, they no longer needed to be disciplined with a rod. So, for our girls, I think we spanked them maybe from the age of two and a half to about five and a half. But after five and a half, they were pretty compliant. They just, it just wasn't necessary. Hmm. The boys were, were a little different. <laughs> uh, and we had one that was particularly difficult and defiant. We and, won't say names. And so, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was about nine or 11 years old, somewhere in there, nine yeah. to 11 years old before we stopped spanking the boys. So it depends on on their compliance and and if the rod is necessary. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that after after we stopped using the rod that we stopped disciplining. We we continued to discipline, we just used other methods. Right. Yeah, yeah. and every every kid's going to be different. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. that's right. such an important mm-hmm. point. You, you don't just draw a line in the sand and say we're going to do it up until this point. Each child, some are more compliant, some require more um yeah, I think uh, I think our kids were probably somewhere nine, ten, uh, but I think you'll know as a parent. You you will know as they're changing when the right time is to shift from a, a physical spanking to something like taking away privileges or grounding. And then you experiment, you try things, and you look for their reaction to see if it's bringing about the reaction that you're looking for, that true repentance or not. And you always then have to shift and as a couple talk it through and and come to the same, again, consistency and agreement between mom and dad are huge. Uh, but it's something you got to talk to with your parents. So there, there is no actual number that I would say on this recording. <laughs> right, right. I agree. There, I wouldn't, I would say the same thing. I know that I was spanked up until I was 16. Oh, wow. And I remember thinking that is way too long. I really felt like that was wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, They were taught that that was what they should do. And so they did, but I really was rebelling against that. So I was like, okay, we're not going to go there. Um, But I do think it was right around that. And I, I remember, I remember when we started moving away from spanking with our oldest. So we still had one that was three years younger. So it, then it's hard. Now you're like, he sees this one not getting a spank, but he's yeah. going to get a spank. So anyways, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dance that you have to kind of figure out like what's working and what's not working. So, um, but I do remember as much as I disliked the spanking process, when we started moving away from it, I remember wishing we could go back to it <laughs> because really it's the, discipline, the discipline when you're not spanking is so much harder because yeah. it requires so much more time. Yeah. I felt like it wasn't quite as teachable. So now I'm just like, I'm grounding you. So now it's it's hours or maybe days and I have to remember it and I have to 
when did I say she was grounded until? <laughs> yeah, and, we would have that then, conversation. So something's yeah. come up and, oh, should I break that? Or, oh, should I allow for that? Or, you know, oh, I didn't. And so anyways, it was it was a mental mind game that was much harder and, and harder to teach through because it, it changed. So I think with every kid, it's going to be a little bit different, but it does, it's challenging in a different way. And so don't be quick to drop yeah. that. If, you, if it's still working with your children and they're responding well to it, just know you're, it's hard to change out of that. Yeah. I mean, it is a heavy topic. It's an important one for children in the early years. But I think we can tease out even what a, a future topic could be, mm. which is how to how to make that transition. And and even I'll tease this out to consider what are your children loving? You kind of mentioned it, Jeff. What a, what are the things that you're watching their reaction that they're really going to be affected by? Yeah. Those are the things that they're loving. Those are the things that they're desiring. Those are the things that they're earnestly wanting. Using those things for discipline, that can be a really effective mm-hmm. tool in, in your arsenal uh, as a parent, and both at a younger age and when they get older. Uh, but that will, I think that merits a future conversation for mm-hmm. us to have here uh, at the Thinking Tree for what does that look like to make that the, make all those harder steps of restrictions and, and how long they last and the duration and all of those things, which, which will be fun. Uh, as we as we wrap up here, is there any final thought? We, we've gone over, but it's okay. It's an important topic here. Any final thought for an encouragement uh, for a parent who might be struggling with this concept, who might be struggling and saying, you know, Tanya, you mentioned like, you know, what if I had a rough experience with this growing up and I, I'm nervous about doing it with my kids? Or is there any encouragement that you guys would give to parents who are struggling with this concept? I, w- I would suggest that they talk to an older, wiser couple for yeah. sure. Um, I, our elder team would be a phenomenal resource to just say, hey, we're struggling with this and this is why. I think analyzing your own heart and really understanding why it is that you're struggling with this um, is something that's important to remember. Um, and sometimes it comes down to it's our own weakness. It's mm-hmm. our own failure. It's our own sin that causes us to not be willing to take that step. I mean, it's clear based on the scriptures that you pointed out, Adam, that it is the loving thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's what's commanded of us. So why are we not willing to do the hard thing for our kid? There's a problem there. Um, when we truly love our children, we're willing to do the hard stuff. I mean, I take my kid to the doctor and they have to get shots. That stinks. That's hard. They're sobbing. They're crying. I don't. I don't like holding them down while they get their vaccinations or take them to the dentist and they have to get their mouth drilled on. I mean, all these things we do, they're the hard things that are for the good of our children. So we need as parents to be willing to say, okay, Lord, you gave me this kid. It's my responsibility to steward them and I'm willing to do the hard stuff for their sake. That's my way of loving them, being obedient to the Lord and loving our kids. And so we have to be willing to do that. So if there's a block, we need to figure out what that is and why. And so I think talking to another person, um, another couple would be a good thing to do. And maybe it's even, can you demonstrate for me what this looks like? What, you know, Explain to me, help me with this. Um, even calling in the moment and saying, hey, this is what we're dealing with is a space banking an appropriate thing here, or should I be doing something else? Help me with this. Um, But as a couple, you need to be on the same page. You cannot have one parent being the disciplinarian and the other one not. Just like Jeff said, the kids are clever. They'll figure that out. They're going to manipulate. They'll say, oh, I can disobey in front of this parent. I can't disobey in front of that parent. It's going to be don't tell mom, don't tell dad. They're going to use that as a dividing factor between you, not when they're super little, but as they get older, they're super smart. Um, So you really want to be like-minded on this. And if you're not, seek counsel until you can be. Um, and just want to encourage you to be willing to do the hard stuff. I just, I just want to say my wife is awesome. Amen. <laughs> you don't well, have anything to add to well, that. What no, she, well, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> what she said. But I mean, tr- tr- we just trust the Lord's, you know, trust his word. Mm-hmm. He, he's giving you the instruction. There, there, there's the right way to do it. Ask for help, but trust what God says. Amen. Amen. Nothing to add, Dave? It's a blessing. It, seriously, uh, d- disciplining your child, establishing structure, even 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 as a baby, when they come home from the hospital, you know, yeah, maybe for the first month or two, you're going to demand feed. But after that, you put them on a schedule. And, and, it's true. And uh, you put them on a schedule. And, and from that, the child learns structure and the t- child learns that there's guardrails in their lives and their child learns that their parent is an authority yeah. over them. It's parent and even leading. so, even from a very early age, you can teach a child, you can discipline a child and teach any, a, a child structure. 
Ooh, that's a whole other episode. I was going to say, it's almost like you're teasing another episode here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Routines or something. Well, wow. that's great. Thank you thank you all for being willing to, to take on this tough subject. Uh, it is important that we orient our children toward God, that we teach his ways, that we correct our children, ultimately with the hope and prayer that through all of these means, even as you're mentioning, Dave, that there's a grace towards helping our children grow up and to know the love of God. That is our greatest desire. And we pray that they would see God's character through our discipline, through our instruction. They would yep. see right. Right. the handprints of our creator in how we are authorities under the greatest authority. Uh, and so we pray that that would be the end of all of our discipline and instruction. Well, thank you, Tanya and Dave, for joining us again here on Thinking Tree. We pray this conversation has helped our listeners renew your minds and reform your hearts. And we'll see you next time.